Okay, so I didn't quite manage to stick to doing this every day, but I'm back on the saddle now, so can we still be friends? Maybe? Uh, I'll try to stick with it for the rest of time, or of this month, whichever comes first. I got some good feedback on the last one, so I may try to do voices again sometime soon. Uh, obviously, if I want to get good at this, I'll have to try it eventually, so I might as well bite the bullet. For now, though, I'm going to try something a bit different. I'm going to spend the next few days reading a single piece rather than haphazardly jumping around. I still want to keep these videos to a length of about 5 to 10 minutes each, too long, and I'm more likely to feel like skipping it on a day when I'm tired. Uh, with that in mind, I've decided to read the speech Self-Made Man by Frederick Douglass. He's obviously a tremendously important figure in American history. Uh, as a former slave who taught himself to read, became a prominent abolitionist, and was the most photographed American of the 19th century. I've never actually read anything by him, though, so here's a chance for me to fix that. Uh, Douglas wrote this speech in 1859 and delivered it more than 50 times across the US, Canada, and Great Britain. The version I'll be reading is from the last known delivery before students of the Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, most likely in 1893, though we don't know for sure. For tonight, I'm going to read the first four pages going by the pagination from the document in the Library of Congress. <clears throat> Self-Made Men. The subject announced for this evening's entertainment is not new. Man, in one form or another, has been a frequent and fruitful subject for the press, the pulpit, and the platform. This subject has come up for consideration under a variety of attractive titles, such as great men, representative men, peculiar men, scientific men, literary men, successful men, men of genius, and men of the world. But under whatever name or designation, the vital point of interest in the discussion has ever been the same, and that is manhood itself, and this in its broadest and most comprehensive sense. This tendency to the universal in such discussion is altogether natural and all-controlling, for when we consider what man as a whole is, what he has been, what he aspires to be, and what, by a wise and vigorous cultivation of, a, of his faculties, he may yet become, we see that it leads irresistibly to this broad view of him as a subject of thought and inquiry. The saying of the poet that the proper study of mankind is man and which has been the starting point of so many lectures, essays, and speeches, holds its place, like all other great utterances, because it contains a great truth, and a truth alike for every age and generation of men. It is always new and can never grow old. It is neither dimmed by time nor tarnished by repetition, for man, both in respect of himself and of his species, is now, and evermore will be, the center of unsatisfied human curiosity. The pleasure we derive from any department of knowledge is largely due to the glimpse, glimpse which it gives to us of our own nature. We may travel far over land and sea, brave all climates, dare all dangers, endure all hardships, try all latitudes and longitudes, we may penetrate the earth, sound the ocean's depths, and sweep the hollow sky with our glasses in the pursuit of other knowledge. We may contemplate the glorious landscape gemmed by forest, lake and river, and dotted with peaceful homes and quiet herds. We may whirl away to the great cities, all aglow with life and enterprise, we may mingle with the imposing assemblages of wealth and power. We may visit the halls where art works her miracles in music, speech, and color, 
and where science unbars the gates to higher planes of civilization, but no, how, but no matter how radiant the colors, how enchanting the melody, how gorgeous and splendid the pageant, man himself, with eyes turned inward upon his own wondrous attributes and powers, surpasses them all. A single human soul, standing here upon the margin we call time, overlooking in the vastness of its range the solemn past which can neither be recalled nor remodeled, ever-changing against finite limitations, entangled with interminable contradictions, eagerly seeking to scan the invisible past and to pierce the clouds and darkness of the ever-mysterious future has attractions for thought and study more numerous and powerful than all other objects beneath the sky. To human thought and inquiry, he is broader than all visible worlds, loftier than all heights, and deeper than all depths. Were I called upon to point out the broadest and most permanent distinction between mankind and other animals, it would be this their earnest desire for the fullest knowledge of human nature on all its many sides. The importance of this knowledge is immeasurable, and by no other is human life so affected and colored. Nothing can bring to man so much happiness or so much of misery as man himself. Today, he exalts himself to heaven by his virtues and achievements. Tomorrow, he smites with sadness and pain by his crimes and follies. But whether exalted or debased, charitable or wicked, whether saint or villain, priest or prize fighter, if only he is, if only he be great in his line, he is an unfailing source of interest, as one of a common brotherhood. For the best man finds in his breast the evidence of kinship with the worst, and the worst with the best. Confront us with either extreme, and you will rivet our attention and fix us in earnest contemplation. For our chief desire is to know what there is in man, and to know him at all extremes and ends and opposites. And for this knowledge, or for the want of it, we will follow him from the gates of life to the gates of death and beyond them. As this subject can never become old, so it can never be exhausted. Man is too closely related to the infinite to be divided, weighed, measured, and reduced to fixed, fixed standards, and thus adjusted to finite comprehension. No two of anything are exactly alike, and what is true of man in one generation may lack some degree of truth in another, but his distinctive qualities as man are inherent and remain forever. Progressive in his nature, he defies the power of progress to overtake him, to make known definitely the limits of his marvelous powers and possibilities. From man comes all that we know or can imagine of heaven and earth, of time and eternity. He is the, the prolific constitutor of manners, morals, religions, and governments. He spins them out as the spider spins his web, and they are coarse or fine, kind or cruel, according to the degree of intelligence reached by him at the period of their establishment. He compels us to contemplate his past with wonder and to survey his future with much the same feelings as those with which Columbus is supposed to have gazed westward over the sea. It is the faith of the race that in man there exists far outlying continents of power, thought, and feeling, which remain to be discovered, explored, cultivated, made practical, and glorified. Mr. Emerson has declared that it is natural to believe in great men. Whether this is a fact or not, we do believe in them and worship them. The visible God of the New Testament is revealed to us as a man 
of like passions with ourselves. We seek out our wisest and best man, the man who, by eloquence or the sword, compels us to believe him such, and make him our leader, prophet, preacher, and lawgiver. We do this not because he is essentially different from us, but because of his identity with us. He is our best representative and reflects, on a colossal scale, the scale to which we would aspire, our highest aims, objects, powers, and possibilities. And that is the end of the first part I'm going to read tonight. Wow, what an amazing opening. Uh, the main thing that jumps out to me is how amazingly optimistic a view of humanity he has, despite having experienced the worst of it. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what else he has to say in the rest of the speech. So, until next time, I'm Dan, and I need an ending tagline. Bye.